So, Michael, welcome, and we look forward to what you've got to say. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this conference. And uh, thank you, Michael, for your very kind words. Michael, as he uh, said, is one of my predecessors as Chief Inspector at Ofsted, one of the most distinguished Chief Inspectors, may I say, as well. Mike, Michael, who did a great job at Ofsted, as he did when he was chair of the, of the Learning Trust here, and really uh, kick-started, fired, Hackney into the, uh, into the stratosphere in terms of what it's doing now. He was, part of the, he was at the very start of, of that process of improving Hackney schools and, and Hackney education. And I know I've had lots of conversations with Michael over the, over the last few years. Whenever uh, I mention Hackney to him, his face glows with pride uh, at what has been happening here over the last few years, and much of the credit for that. Uh, is down to the Learning Trust and to Michael and others who worked with him. So it's great to be back in Hackney, my old stomping ground, and not a lot of people know this, but I did work in Hackney in the 1970s when things weren't as good as they are now. So I've seen Hackney in its worst days, and also, and also the, the trajectory of improvement that we've seen over the last few years. So it's great to be back and see Hackney doing so well. Just a few figures I've extracted from our data teams at, at Ofsted. 90% of all schools are now judged by Ofsted to provide at least a good level of education. And for secondary schools, it's 100% in Hackney, which is fantastic. Not a single Hackney school was judged inadequate at its last inspection, not a single one. That's above the London average and well above the average for England as a whole. The GCSE attainment gap between pupils on free school meals and their peers is 12% lower here than the national average. And some of these figures are going to appear uh, in a few weeks' time in my second annual report, where we are going to say nice things about Hackney. You need to know that. We're going to be saying nice <laughs> things about Hackney and uh, not so nice things about one or two other places that should compare well with Hackney. But Aunt, I won't mention those places to you now. Um, the rate of improvement in Hackney's primary schools has been truly remarkable. How many primary people are going? Fantastic. From 2009 to 2011, only around 60% of children in this borough attended a good or better primary school. Today it's 85%. And 93% of children in Hackney's primary schools are making the expected progress in maths and English. So that's all a very good news story and a remarkable one, and a remarkable one for me who's seen Hackney over various decades. But in many ways, it should be good. That's the thing about Hackney, it should be good. Unlike parts of England which I see on a regular basis, which are monocultural and monoethnic, this is a, a, a diverse borough, uh, a very uh, multi-ethnic borough, lots of keen, ambitious families. So it should be do uh, should be doing well, and it should have been, and it should have been doing well years ago when it when it wasn't. And if poor leadership was at the root of what went wrong in Hackney years ago, poor lead, poor political leadership, poor leadership from the local authority, and poor leadership in individual institutions, that's all changed. Leadership has changed things in Hackney. It shows what leadership can do, and that's going to be the heart of what I have to say to you uh, uh, this morning. Jules Pipe, the mayor, who's totally committed to education reform and improvement in Hackney. I know that from speaking to him over the, over the years. Alan Wood, who's been an absolutely inspirational uh, chief executive, uh, executive, and of course Mike. And the thing about Hackney leaders is that they've been brave. And you, I don't think you can be a really good leader, certainly not an outstanding one, unless you are brave. Because I was the, the head of the first academy in Hackney and in East London at a time when no one wanted academies. It were incredibly, not controversial now, but they were controversial, very controversial 10 years ago, and certainly controversial in this part of the borough. 
But both Michael and Alan stood absolutely four square behind me and said, this is what's going to happen here. And made it, and made it work. He invited not only people like me in, but also the sponsor of Mossbourne, Clive Bourne, who was an inspirational figure. He wasn't an educationist, but he who was totally committed to improvement at, at, at Moss, Mossbourne and showed what somebody who had absolutely no knowledge of education can bring to the table. And of course, Hackney was part of London Challenge. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot more about London Challenge because I know Michael's going to talk about that later. But the thing about London Challenge is this, is that it wasn't a bureaucracy. I was part of it, so I know. It wasn't a bureaucracy. It was led by good leaders, good school leaders, who knew what good and outstanding looked like and were prepared to convey difficult and tough messages to other school leaders and governors who weren't prepared to do what they were doing. And, that what, and that's what needs to happen in the rest of the country. We need more London challenges, sub-regional challenges, as I've called them, to improve performance in those parts of England that are not performing nearly as well as Hackney. We need more of that. So lessons to be learned from Hackney are these, and I know Suffolk, there are representatives from Suffolk here today, and I'm sure they're learning from, from Hackney's experience over the last 10 to, uh, to 15 years. Lessons to be learned are no excuses, because I remember when people said, you can't do much in Hackney. I always tell the story of Cly Clybourne addressing a large assembly in Hackney Town Hall and saying, this academy is going to come to Hackney Downs. And somebody said, and it's going to happen in 18 months. We're going to build it in 18 months. And somebody said, oh, listen, mate, you can't build a public toilet here in 18 months. <laughs> it, you've got to have that optimism of spirit. You've got to be able to to say it can be done, it can be done, no excuses. Because, you know, I remember not just Hackney, people saying London's too big, it's too diverse, it's too multi-ethnic, it's too poor, it can't be done in London. And yet look at London now. And you'll hear the same story, I hear the same story as I go up and down England, it can't be done in these post-industrial communities, it can't be done in Norfolk, it can't be done in Suffolk, oh, you know, families here, etc. You hear it, you hear it. When what it needs of people like you saying, yes, it can. So leadership is absolutely critical. That's the first point I wait, I'm going to make, because without good leadership, nothing much follows. Because all of us know what does raise attainment. High quality teaching. So let me make it clear, absolutely crystal. Uh, I've said it before, and I'm going to say it here. When inspectors go into schools and look at teaching, we do not have a preferred style. We do not talk about three-part lessons or anything like that. We don't want to see starters and plenaries. And all. What we want to see are children focused, engaged, learning, and making progress. And it's pretty obvious if they're doing that. Not engaged in a low-level way, colouring bits of paper in and cutting out things, but learning, deep knowledge. That's what we want to see. So get away from this idea that inspectors, and please write in to me if you are inspected and somebody says, well, where's that three part lesson? I will take that cause up. It means rigorous assessment and you know levels are going. So assessment is going to be even more important for you now and you need to demonstrate to uh, inspectors that you know how children are progressing, um, whether they know and understand what the issues are and that they are making progress to reach the targets that you have set, which have been demonstrated in the outcomes that, you, that you're achieving at the end of the key stage. So you, you know, that should be a priority in your develop, development plan. With the removal of levels, what are you going to do to demonstrate that children are making progress? So high quality teaching, rigorous assessment, strong intervention when it's needed, effective use of additional funds, including the pupil premium, an aspirational culture where high expectations permeate every aspect of the school. And proper differentiation between pupils, particularly at both ends of the ability spectrum. We produced a report a couple of months ago on how our most able children were doing in the non-selective system, in the secondary system. It, and it, it made for pretty miserable reading. You know, something like 30,000 children get you know, level fives at primary school. Uh, going on to secondary school and not achieving a level B in English and maths. So, you know, we need to make sure, and I'm a passionate believer in the non-selective system, that our most able children are doing well.
as well as the least able. But none of these things, as I've said before, happens without you and without uh, good leadership. They say no school is better than the quality of its teachers. What's usually overlooked is that without good leaders, good, te good teachers simply cannot flourish. I was seconded, I, mean, I always tell this story, but it's, I think it's, it's, it, re it reflects what happens in so many schools. I was seconded to a badly failing school in, uh, in, in Newham, East London, um, I know, a dozen years ago. And um, it was in a poor way. And I remember the director of edu education at the time saying to me, Michael, this is a terrible place. When you go in there, you know everything's awful. We've taken away the budget, etc., etc. Uh, just, I just want to forewarn you about what you're going, going into. So I went into, I, I, into the school, met the usual. We were in a caretaker. And he says, oh, why have you come here, mate? You know, even, uh, even the Alsatians go around in pairs, that sort of stuff. You know. <laughs> But what, but what I did see, of course, was the reverse. I actually saw a lot of good teachers coming in at very early in the morning, doing their best in a very difficult situation, staying late at night, marking their books, etc., etc. The reason it wasn't working was because the leadership was poor. It wasn't pulling it all together. It wasn't identifying good practice, not disseminating it, uh, uh, good practice, not building on, on the people that were doing a good job there. Yes, there was bad practice, but the leadership was really poor, and that's why... It, it's, it's so important. It's always been difficult to retain and promote excellent school leaders, but if anything, the challenge is becoming harder as the baby boomer generation of heads retires and younger, less experienced colleagues take their place. And this is happening at a time when we're asking so much more of our schools. So what does good leadership look like? And what is preventing so many of our schools from being well-led? Obviously, there isn't a sort of uh, model type of good leader. It comes in different forms. Angela Merkel is not Alex Ferguson, and neither is uh, Richard Branson. But good leaders share similar characteristics and have similar qualities. The best leaders work out what is best for them and the institutions which they lead. So I've, over the years, I've developed Wilshaw's way. It owes a bit to Nelson Mandela, a bit to Mother Teresa, a bit to Machiavelli, a bit to Clint Eastwood, as you'd expect, and an awful lot to Frank Sinatra. <laughs> in, and you know the song I'm talking about. So let's start with vision. That old word, vision, well-used word. All leadership courses emphasize it, and for good reason. If you don't know where you're going, why should anyone follow you? Why should anyone follow you? It's not just about coming up with a natty slogan. Shove it in, shoving it on the stationery and make everyone parrot it. What really, motiv what really motivates you to do what you do? And can you make others believe it? And it should be pragmatic, pragmatic as well as idealistic. How do you translate your vision into improving the life chances of children in the school? What does it look like on the ground? That's the important thing, not what appears on the prospectus. After all, be honest. Who is your vision for? It has to be for children. And if it's not, you really aren't focused on the one thing that matters. It's pointless concocting grand plans if the school playground's a mess, uniforms are slovenly, staff are too casual, children pay more attention to their mobile phones than to the teachers, and the school reception has all the charm of the check-in desk at Ryanair. The best leaders get the details right and the small issues right because they know that these underpin the big issues of student achievement and progress. This comes across in the obvious pride that good leaders have for their institutions. They don't need to usher visitors quickly into segregated areas away from the children. They want to show their schools off. That's a key quality of good leaders. They are proud of their institutions. They're not nervous about children being taught and interacting with each other and with staff. They never like being out of the school and always feel a bit nervous when they're out of the school. Head teachers Winston Churchill once said, have head teachers Churchill once said, have powers at their disposal with which prime ministers have never been invested. He may have been overstating the case, but people in this room will know heads have huge authority and power 
to determine the culture and success of the school. But authoritative leadership is not the same as autocratic leadership. Staff and students can't thrive in a culture of fear, but nor can they thrive in a chaotic school where there is an absence of authority. Indeed, children who come from homes where there are few boundaries and few rules need more structure and not less. That's always been my view. And it's also my view that raising attainment is predicated on a, on a culture in which heads do everything they can to reinforce not only their own authority, but the authority of all the staff in the school, all the staff teaching and non-teaching staff. If youngsters feel that they are in a more powerful position than the teacher, the teaching assistant, or the dinner lady, that they can defy authority and do so with impunity, no amount of theorising by me on any, or anyone else on raising attainment will make much of a difference. Good schools are staffed by people, including newly qualified teachers and those in the early years of the profession, who feel confident that they can challenge children not only to behave, but to achieve without endless negotiation and sterile argument, which we see sometimes in poor schools. If, when I was ahead, I saw a member of staff turning a blind eye to a child dropping a bit of litter in the playground, I'd have had a stern word with the child and told him to pick it up, but then I'd have gone back and seen that member of staff and said, why did you let that happen? In a good school, everyone has a part to play in creating an orderly institution and a good learning environment. And there's absolutely nothing wrong, in my view, in saying to youngsters, do as I ask, because I'm the adult. I'm older than you. I know more than you. And by the way, I'm in authority over you. That's important. Good leaders get the balance right between taking the time for the difficult child, taking the time for the pastoral care and welfare of the individual and the needs of the great majority of children who want to learn and make progress. They understand that schools should not be extension of social services or education welfare, although our links with the, both those organisations and institutions are, are vital. They should be places of learning in which children get one chance, one chance of acquiring the knowledge, skills and qualifications do in, well in life. And that should be your guiding, uh, guiding view as a head, expressed to your staff. Children just have one chance. They don't get it again. They recognise, heads recognise that every hour spent with a difficult child is an hour away from the classroom and the monitoring of teaching and learning. So get that balance right. People expect head teachers to be in command, to be in authority. Those who don't exercise it in a professional and compassionate manner fail to understand the importance of their position. Of course, a position of power does not give you licence to do what you want. Good leaders acknowledge and nurture the contribution of others. Talent can be found in the most challenging of schools. Seek out the good people. Build on their strengths in a way that wasn't being done in that school I mentioned. I could never have achieved what I did at my schools in East London without the support of a lot of people. Successful heads aren't Roman emperors, but they do need a praetorian guard to support them at difficult times. You owe it to your staff and students to <coughs> knit together a leadership team that will strengthen and improve your school even in your absence and be loyal to you when times get tough. But however good your staff are, always challenge them to do better. Complacency is easy, easily slipped into and very, very difficult to shake off. Constantly question, constantly demand. This won't make you popular, but if you wanted applause, you'd have joined a circus. And ask yourself hard questions too. Was that worth it? Am I doing the right thing? What would I do def differently next time? Self-review, self-knowledge is always present in a good head. But take care. Do not confuse careful reflection with self-doubt. Do not be seduced by the latest teaching fad or be swept away on a tidal wave of new initiatives. As a head, my guide was always this. Does this initiative impact on the classroom? Will it improve teaching? Will it improve the progress of the children? If it didn't, never mind what circular, whatever it said, I didn't adopt it. You know the path you must follow, stick to it. And be brave. Confront issues head on. I've talked about bravery, it's an important quality. 
It helps that your priorities are pretty straightforward. The children always come first. If anyone is preventing them from getting the education they deserve, be they unreasonable union reps, and we know a lot of them are very reasonable, but there are some that aren't, or foot-dragging local politicians, fight the good fight. And lastly, don't forget to have fun. That's important. You know, watching that episode of Educator Yorkshire, I'm sure you've seen a few, I've only seen bits, but I saw the head dancing down the corridor, skipping down the corridor, having a good time. It's not something I did at Mossball. I think the staff would have had a heart attack if they saw me do that. <laughs> but, you know, he enjoyed his life. Enjoy headship, because there's no better job than being a teacher, no better job than being a head. You are shaping the children, children's lives and shaping the society in which we live. So it's good to remember, when the boiler has packed up, the fly, fire alarm has gone off, and the fight has just had to be broken up in the playground, good times are never very far away. My, gu my guide for school leadership will, I hope, resonate with many of you and give confidence to you. And we need that confidence because we need good leaders in our classroom. Future leaders and Teach First are bringing them. But despite increased attractions, increased pay and extra freedoms heads now enjoy, school leaders still face significant obstacles. I just want to mention one or two of them before I finish. The first is training. It's certainly the case that support programmes for would-be school leaders have been transformed in recent years. This is an excellent development. But the existing, existing system is far too fragmented and not consistent at all levels. As I've said, there are examples of excellent practice in some parts of the country, but there are not nearly enough, particularly for middle leaders. That's a big challenge for you, actually, as heads, if you're the head here, is to make sure your middle leaders are ready for headship and leadership at some point. So make sure the training is good. Robust performance management is not just the responsibility of the head teacher, but of the middle leaders and those with curriculum and pastoral responsibilities. The close relationship the head of department has with his or her team around the coffee table at break times should not get in the way of those tough conversations which have to be had when underperformance is identified. Too many schools are failing to nurture and develop the next generation of school leaders, and that will have cat catastrophic consequences for our system if that doesn't happen. And too many governing bodies are failing to appoint the best. That's what our inspectors find. In seeking, in seeking success ahead, governors too often appoint what they know and what is familiar and not what the school needs. If we're serious about long-term school improvement, this has to change. That's why I've argued that arrangements with governments need, governance needs reform. We need a more professional approach in many governing bodies, especially, especially in our most challenging schools and deprived communities. If that means paying governors, so be it. And I think the governors really act upon this, needs to act upon this quickly. I've said it before and I do so again today. Where there's a lack of skills and capacity at a voluntary level, we should not rule out paid governance. We all know that many more schools have greater autonomy and freedom than they've ever had before, but these things in themselves, freedom and autonomy, are not a panacea for improvement. We need heads who can handle autonomy and who use their freedoms to drive improvement. I, I uh, made a speech at the Independent Schools Conference, a headmasters and headmistresses conference the other day. It caused a stir. I, I said they weren't doing enough to support the state system, so the heads of Harrow and Rugby and Eton were all there. It was shock, horror at what I said. But the point I was making to them was this, that they've been running autonomous schools for donkey's years. Why aren't they sponsoring more academies? Why aren't they sponsoring more, uh, more schools and showing how autonomy and freedom and independence can work? And uh, they didn't fall over themselves to say, hooray, we, hallelujah, we've seen, it, we've seen what we have to do. Um, so we need head teachers who can... Um, and know how to handle autonomy. And, and I just want to alert everyone that Ofsted will be looking at this much more closely in the autumn term. There'll be some, some uh, tweaking to the inspection framework. So when inspectors come in and visit an academy or a free school, they'll be asking that question. You're free, you're independent of the local authority, you've got rights over paying conditions. How are you using them? And, is it, it, and are you using them to improve performance. That will be a, a slight change to the impact inspection framework. Um, the other thing is, do heads, and you can ask yourself this question, do heads and school leaders 
have the legitimacy to manage in a way the, their colleagues, manage their colleagues in a way that other professions do. How many teachers not only grumble about their managers' decisions, but also question their right even to make them? This is partly historical. In the past, some local authorities not only didn't care about ins installing good heads, they actively undermined them if they offended vested interests. That's a controversial thing to say, but I'm going to say it. This was certainly the case from my experiences in, uh, in London in the 70s and 80s. Even today, too many teachers still think that school leaders do not have the right to tell them how to teach or what to do. The staff room, in their minds, is just as capable of deciding the direction of, of the school as much uh, of a right as the senior leadership team in their head. Now, I accept that some SLTs are not as good as they could be. I accept that too many implement the latest management gobbledygook without thinking things through. But I've come to the conclusion that many of their efforts are undermined by a pervasive resentment of all things managerial. Some teachers simply will not accept that a school isn't a collective, but an organisation with clear hierarchies and separate duties. While it's true we all share a common purpose, our responsibilities in schools are not the same. What's worse, far too many school leaders seem to believe that they don't have a right to manage. They worry constantly about staff reaction. They hold endless meetings to curry favour. They seem to think they cannot act without their employees' approval. Yes, of course you should consult the staff. Of course you should explain. Of, but never confuse consultation with negotiation. We must take the staff with us at all costs, the misguided and weak head will say. No, you mustn't. Not if it means leaving the children behind. The challenge for the future is finding heads that, confront, that can confront these obstacles and overcome them. But I'm optimistic. Nationally, schools are now improving at a rate unprecedented in Ofsted's history. We now have nearly 80% of schools in the last count that are judged to be good or better compared to 70% this time last year. So the system is improving. We've got to translate that in, that those judgments of improvement into good outcomes, especially when the PISA results are published in three weeks' time. It'll be interesting to see what they say, what that says. And we've got the best new generation of teachers coming into our classrooms. That's what I believe, and that's what colleagues had to say. And if the National College can identify and nurture this potential, we can be confident of having great school leaders in the years to come. And if there's one final lesson I would give leaders and aspiring leaders, leaders, it is this. Be careful, be vigilant, and never be complacent. A lifetime of hard work can be undone very quickly. To build a successful school takes a leader years, and to destroy, as Winston also said, can be the thoughtless act of a single day or a single week. So thank you for listening to, uh, to me, and I'm very happy to take questions, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, I realise it's the end of the day. However much it's been interesting and uh, enthusing, it is the end of the day. Uh, and so uh, I will try and stick to time uh, and uh, try and draw out. I, as the day has gone on, and I've been here from the start, I, I have some slides, but actually all of them have been used already. Um, <laughs> Which, which, will, which in one sense is quite... Because I want actually to... Tr I think what I'm going to do is try to draw out some of the major messages that, that I think are important. But I hope you'll forgive me uh, at this point if I just set out just a few features of my own personal background because to understand why I am so passionate about what we have been doing in Hackney and in London is because of this. Um, I was born... At, so that you know, and no doubt, I was born in uh, uh, the greatest county in the country, and that's Yorkshire. <laughs> but importantly, my mother left school at 13, and my father left school at 14 in those days. That, 
happened to a lot of parents. They weren't unique in that sense. The only two, only two careers that were open to young people like me in that area, I could go into the coal mining, which most of my mother's family were in, or I could go into the steel work, which is where most of my father's and my father and family were in. Do you entirely, entirely to the good fortune of going to a primary and secondary schools where a few teachers, not all, but a few teachers, thought that I had something and thought that it was worth developing. And they did develop it. And therefore, everything that I've been able to do, and I have, I literally have had a fantastic career. And I, I'm quite clear now, you only define a career in retrospect. The, the idea of having a career moving forward is absolutely, it doesn't work, forget it. But you can look at your career in hindsight. Is entirely due to those teachers and those opportunities that they gave me. So my passion is, if I came via that means to do what I've been able to do and enjoy what I've been able to do, I want that same opportunity for every, every child in this country. And until every child has that opportunity, I will not rest. Now, Maybe we can never achieve it, but I'm not going to give up until we've had a jolly good go. Education, therefore, was a gift to me, a gift which I think is probably the most significant gift any young person can have. So that's where uh, I, I, I come from, and, and if you detect any sort of passion in what I say, that's why. Just to put the context, I came to London in 1982 as an HMI with responsibility for being the link between the department and the then Secretary of State, Sir Keith Joseph, and the ILEA. So I then knew Hackney as a division of the ILEA, and I hastened to add at that point in time, the then uh, Chief Education Officer said to me, when I was talking about the different divisions, he said, the problem is we can't get anybody to want to teach in di that division, nor can we get any officers from the centre here to want to be the officers in that division either. So, the problems and challenges of Hackney as a division were there long before they became a separate firm. So I think uh, I, th I think I can just about claim to have some knowledge and experience of London schools over the last 30 years. In 1997, and I picked 1997 very, very specifically. In 1997, when Tony Blair's government came into power, 16 percent, 16 percent of students in London schools gained five GCSEs at A to C. Did not necessarily include English and mathematics. 16%. And there was considerable concern with the standards of attainment in both primary and secondary schools. Remember, we, 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 we had a national curriculum, we had all the tests and all the rest of it. And of course, the other problem for London was that every MP is in London. They may not, be, may not be their constituency, but they're there. So whenever education came up, London was the whipping boy about education uh, uh, as well. And of course, the, apart from overall attainment, there was considerable concern with the very, very substantial gaps in achievement between students from different socioeconomic groups and from students among students from various ethnic minorities. In London, as some of you will only too well know, some 35% of pupils are eligible for free school meals against a national average of 15%. And that 35 is an average. It's higher in some boroughs than it is in others. And the diversity characteristics were also greater than any other area. This bothered the politicians quite considerably about London schools. And... What I want to touch upon is something about London Challenge and what happened there and what we learned. Because in 2003, London Challenge was launched by Estelle Morris. It was to be a five-year programme in the first instance. It wasn't promised that there would be phase two, but it was talked about as a five-year programme. A substantial sum of money was set aside to support that challenge programme. Just to complete the second phase, ran from 2008 to 2011, and at that point in 2008, I had responsibility for London Challenge as its chief advisor. And I can tell you, at that point in time, the sum of money that I had at that point in 2008 was £80 million. Pounds.
While phase one, the 2000, uh, 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 an eight to 2011, uh, sorry, 2003, that was almost entirely devoted to dealing with the secondary schools. It was only phase two which saw the introduction of the challenge beginning to be involving primary schools. At the same time as in 2008, two further similar challenge areas were created, one in the black country and one in Manchester. They chose slightly different titles, but they, are, they, kept, they now come under the heading of city challenges uh, in, that, in that sense. So first of all, I wanted to deal with London challenge. You can see the background. Every, as I say, every MP is, is, is there to be, to be, to know, be knowledgeable about. The evening standard was, gave them every bit of ammunition you can imagine uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of criticism. So what were the features that we, that in initially Tim Brighouse was the first, uh, he, he, got the, he got the title commissioner which he didn't like, uh, the, the press, uh, press reduced it to czar, uh, and, he, and if you know Tim Brighouse that doesn't rest easily with him as a term at all, uh, but, but he, he preferred the, 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 the title of chief advisor really more than anything else. Now, what I want to look at is the features. Now, if you were involved at all, or you know, you, know, you can argue about which of the features were more or less important in this uh, process. In my view, uh, is that across the whole, each had a part to play, but not an e a same part in, in all the different circumstances. The first point I think is important. The climate at the time was one, uh, the point was one in which blame and criticism. We wanted to replace that concept, get rid of it, because it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to build the confidence and self-esteem of teachers who we needed to be on side with the project. We needed them to want to be with us. We couldn't force them, but we wanted them to be with us. And the first thing we, uh, that, that Tim wanted to do and did do, and I kept going uh, uh, and so on, was to say, look, Forget this, if we all accept we've got to improve, the thing is, let's talk about improvement. Let's talk about the fact that we can improve. And let's talk about what you need to help that improvement. And that improvement then you could talk about would link to support. So we weren't just talking about what you need to do, we were saying, and what you need to do it, and here it is then. Carefully tailored. Every school's different, every, need, every school has different needs tailored project. But the first thing was actually to try to lift the confidence and, and self-esteem of teachers who'd been hammered continually about the, the, the performance of the schools. The assumption, of course, is that the, entirely that performance, entirely and utterly, is dependent upon every teacher in every school. No one talked about family matters or deprivation or anything like that. It was all your fault, so to speak. It's easy when you've got somebody to whip. It's very easy to do that. Politicians are very good at finding a whipping boy when they want one. So we needed to shift, shift the language. So what we, what we introduced in terms of how we dealt with the schools that were most in need of support, we talked about the heading was keys to success. That was the phrase that was invented and used. Keys to success. Not, not, nothing else. Keys to success. And it was a slogan that was used for every bit of the programme. And, of course, initially, that programme was focused on those schools who were struggling most in terms of improvement. So what did the menu of support consist of? Well, perhaps, first of all, how did we identify the schools across uh, the whole of the 32 boroughs? Because it didn't just involve inner London, it involved outer London boroughs as well. 32 uh, boroughs in total. Well, we had a lot of data. We had Ofsted data and, and, uh, and all the uh, information from inspection. Uh, we had all the DFE data as well. Uh, and it was possible to identify those schools in difficulty. Some of them just shouted out at you. Oddly enough, some of them were the ones I was bothered about when they were part of ILEA. And still being uh, a course of them. The first thing was data. What Tim did, I think, was the biggest breakthrough, and it's been adopted now nationally, was to create, from the data, families of schools. 
That was the biggest turning point in talking with head teachers to say to them, look, these are schools with more or less the same characteristics as you. Free school meals, special needs, socioeconomic back, all the things that, that often are used as we can't do it here because. Now you can create these families of schools relatively easily, even in a smallish area. It doesn't have to be of the scale that we had to adopt for the 32 boroughs. And we had those families uh, uh, of schools, and you, you, you talked to the head and said, OK, um, here we are, there are five other schools with more or less, not exactly, more or less within reason, the same characteristics as you. <coughs> now, can you explain to me why you're six out of six? And can you not tell me that there's something to be learned from the number one, two, or three, or whatever, that might help you no longer be number six? And that was a breakthrough. Because until then, I have to say to you, the characteristic of, of, of discussion was you can't expect more from the kids in this school because of where they come from. I will not tolerate that argument at all. It might be more difficult, but it ain't impossible. And furthermore, it's those kids that deserve and need the greatest opportunity. So data, but used in a way which was very sensible, very systematic and difficult to argue against. We also were able, within the challenge, to appoint a team of both uh, local and national leaders of education. What we had in London, therefore, was a group of head teachers who were running the best schools by any measure you want. And that wasn't always about GCSE scores or key stage, well, key stage three scores. Then key stage two wasn't important because we didn't have primary on board. What we got was a, a small team of, well, small and it grew, led by a, a practicing head teacher, and those head teachers came to an agreement with London Challenge that they would make themselves available at the drop of a hat to go into a school either because the present leadership was struggling or because it was a new leader who needed some mentoring and support. Now, not surprisingly, some of the money that we had was used to be able to recognise their contribution through an honorarium payment. And in those cases, of course, it was up to the governors and the head about how they split that honorarium between the school and themselves. That was not our affair uh, at all. So we had that group of head teachers who would say, right, you tell me tomorrow morning I need to be at X, I'll be at X. So the important point about that was, whatever the menu was and whatever the need was, I have always found that, it, that you cannot say to a school, well, you need this, but you can't have it for three months or six months, or you can have it next year. They want it and they need it there and then. And that was the goal of, of that process. We also were able to appoint a, a group of challenge advisors. They were appointed and employed by the DfE, which accounted for quite a bit of the money. They were, they were previous, uh, uh, previous head teachers who had come out to, to do this. And they covered subjects, they covered behaviour uh, and, 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 and uh, diversity and all the rest of it. And they would work with the school. They would be there, they'd work with the school, they'd work with the management team as well to support them. Not to dictate, to support. So that was the next bit. We, had, we, we were equally clear that we could not, we could not at that point easily attract teachers into London. Though we have the biggest teacher training institutions in London, the fact was that at a certain point, the limit was about four years working in London before you had to move out because you couldn't afford to buy a house or whatever in London. Now that problem has spread much wider than London, in fact. And therefore, what we needed was to grow our own. We needed to develop our own. So we had a particular programme done with the Institute of Education for future leaders. And this was about head teachers' talent spotting. Not that they were currently deputies necessarily, though many were, but people who had some indication in, in the way that they've progressed so far, they could be tomorrow's leaders. And we got them, we, there, there were special programmes created for them so that we could see whether they could develop. They could also come to some decision about whether this was where they wanted to go with their career. But that had enormous impact. So we had special ones for, for deputy heads, we had ones for aspiring heads of departments. We had ones for heads of departments aspiring to be... We wanted to make sure 
that we were giving real attention to the people, because at the end of the day, it was the teachers and so on in the schools who were going to make the difference. They were going to make the difference. We had an absolute, and Tim did like it, we had absolute focus on teaching and learning. And you've heard that. It, you can't escape the focus on teaching and learning. Uh, and insofar as you focus on that, you equally can't afford not to make the tough decisions. But only after you've given every opportunity for improvement to be, to be made. We had funding to increase staffing in any school on a temporary basis. So we could put in extra staffing, which didn't come out of the school's budget, but actually came out of the challenge budget. In extreme cases, in extreme cases, sometimes we would look for structural solutions. And we'd look for it sometimes with the diocesan authorities themselves who were bothered. But we, sometimes we had to say, at some point, this is not working, we need to look at different uh, propositions. And it was behind that that part of the whole concept of the academy sprang into thinking about new start, etc., etc. Final thing is that we also gave effort and time to strengthening the local authority's capacity to aid improvement. Now, th th that was part of the, the menu. What, what then were the outcomes? Uh, and I think... For us, the major test was whether or not teachers and schools together felt more confident and more able to take responsibility for their own improvement. The whole is touched throughout the day. My view, and, and you may find this odd as a former chief inspector, no, no one from outside coming in for whatever small period of time actually brings about improvement. They can give you an agenda for improvement, but they can't bring about that improvement. The only people who can bring about improvement are those within the school. And therefore, you have to build the capacity in the school such that when you've got it to a certain point, you can set it loose and it can improve itself and continue to do so. And that has worked in London. So, Having started well below the national average for five, for five GCSEs, and I'll come up to the present for, for ATCs including English and Maths, by 2005 London was above the national average and it has continued to improve and remain above the national average. In 2010, and, it's, and, and you heard this morning even later, data will come out next, next couple of weeks or so, in 2010 Ofsted reported that a higher proportion of good and outstanding secondary schools were in London than anywhere else in the country. In 2008, there were 40 secondary schools below the government's floor target. By 2011, there was one. In primary, when we got on to the starting that in, in, in 2008, just six, in 2011, just 6% of primary schools were below the floor target. From the start of 2008, uh, for three years, that had been a 92% reduction in the number of primary schools below floor target. And attainment gaps, both for students with free school meals and, and, and non-free school meals, and also in, in ethnic groups, all had been narrowed. They hadn't got to the point of being absolutely equal, but the gap was, so, it was narrowed to a point where you could see yourself getting to the point. And in Hackney, that's happened. By 2011, tw 26 out of the 32 boroughs I mentioned had a minimum of two outstanding secondary schools. And of course, they were therefore part catalyst for, for maintaining and taking forward that improvement. Teacher recruitment and retention had improved and unfilled vacancies in London by 2009-10 had fallen to just over 1%, 1%, lower than nationally. And this is all about, for me, it's all about valuing people, investing in people, making people feel that they can do the job, but if they can't, equally making the tough decisions. So I think by any means, London Challenge has been a success. 
and of course in a form, it continues today. It's self-generating now. We don't, it doesn't need a set of people in the department. It doesn't need people like me. It, it's doing it itself. So I think what are the lessons? Well, for me, there are four. One, we've got, first of all, to use positive language to increase confidence and self-esteem amongst the professionals in our school. And that's not just the teachers, that's the non-teaching staff and everybody involved with it. And we've got to have credible people working with them to offer support. The whole thing in London was when, when, where, when uh, inspection started and the RI pulled up at the school in London, the first thing the head teacher would say to them is, and when did you last teach in London? And when they said, well, I've never taught in London, their credibility fell through the floor. Well, what the hell do they know about? And so, so credibility is important. Secondly, we, are, we were convinced pre fairly early on, and even more convinced now, School on school work, school on school support, school on school involvement, particularly involving a, a good outstanding school or in some cases we involve no more than a good or outstanding department of a secondary school. That is by far and away the most effective method of school improvement, much more effective than external inspection and all the rest. Thirdly, whatever your process, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be consistent in what you want, and you've got to be consistent in the way that you measure whether that progress is being made. Challenge, of course, challenge fairly, and challenge positively. But when tough decisions have to be made, make those tough decisions. Because as Michael said, and as others have said, we're talking about children's education, and they get one chance. Sadly, in this country, they get one chance. Uh, we don't understand the idea of continuous education um, uh, at all. You know, in this country, it's by age. If 16th of June, at the, in, the, in year 11, if you're not ready for GCSE maths, tough, you're sitting it. Uh, and if you fail, well, we knew you were going to fail. If you'd had another year, you'd have succeeded. But 16 is it. And of course, league tables don't want to know when you do it a year later. So I'm, I'm all for stage, not age. But I've said this for so long and been kicked around, so I'm not, I'll stay it again, but there's nobody here to kick me, I don't think. <laughs> and fourthly, build up, build up, and ensure that you have internal capacity in every school. Is being did. Sometimes that internal capacity may start only in one department, one air subject area. But gradually it will permeate into other parts of the school and it will permeate in, into the whole of the school. Now, of course, if you say to me, I want to, uh, switching from that, I want in parallel to say, what about Hackney? Well, you've heard a lot already, but you will not be surprised to say, if I'm asked where my heart lies, it lies in Hackney, uh, and I've said this many times. Just to fit the context, which is not, not a lot has been said so far, uh, so in 2000, in the year 2000, the local authority was in dire straits. Uh, Oh, I, I shouldn't have said that because it's one of the pop groups I like, actually. Um, but they were in trouble on almost every front. They were bankrupt. I mean, and I mean bankrupt. And uh, report after report had indicated that they weren't able to get themselves out of this. If you were anywhere around, the, the headline was the basket case. That was how it was described. We won't say by whom, because that will get me into trouble. Um, and the government began to be worried about uh, it and, and wanted to know what to do about intervention. I was uh, uh, due to retire as Chief Inspector in 2002, and the then Secretary of State, Estelle Morris, said to me, I've got a job for you. And uh, I said, what's that? She said, well, we're going to intervene in Hackney, uh, and we want you to lead that intervention. Uh, and... Well, I did. We created a not-for-profit body. That was important. A not-for-profit body. It was, an, it was by direction of the Secretary. It's the only time a Secretary of State has used direction. The authority had no choice. It was directed to do this under the, under the law of the, day, of the day. And we wanted a not-for-profit body. Prior to that, there had been 
a partial privatisation with a company that I need not mention but has a long history that was responsible for school improvement and for the administration also uh, of, of the uh, uh, service around the multi-ethnic grant. And it was very clear to both ministers and certainly to me that that, that bit was simply not working. The private company weren't able to do the job. They couldn't do the job. So eventually Estelle Morris decided I'm going to create, I'm going to order the authority to do this. And so we were involved in creating an entirely new organisation in the sense of it being independent of the local authority. Totally independent, it had only one concern, that was education. And in the creation of the, of the contract for that, I was, I was involved at the, at the latter stages, I mean, Alan Wood, bless his heart, went through uh, weeks and months of, of going through every word in this contract. I wanted to make sure, because when, when I came in in the May, I thought I was going to get three months to, uh, to, to get used to being home. Uh, but in fact, uh, Estelle said to me one day, she said, actually, you can't. You've got to go in straight away. I said, why? She said, well, I've just realised that under the agreement, uh, there's only the chair of the board got the appoint members of the board, and the board's got to be up and operating by uh, the end of the school year, i.e. July. So you've got to go in. Uh, thanks very much, you know, and I love you too. Uh, but I was therefore able to be part of the, the contractual discussions. And the one thing I wanted, and the one thing I got, was that every penny of money designated by the Secretary of State for Education was passed through the authority in total, direct to the Learning Trust and then direct to schools. And that would happen every year for 10 years. Because just before I came in, every school had had a hold on their budgets and told they couldn't spend a penny and they clawed back a million in May from the budgets they'd only announced in early April. So you can imagine how the schools felt at that point in time. But we secured that. Uh, and I think it, was, it, it really was... Uh, very, very important. We created the Learning Trust and the board, say not-for-profit, it was independent of the local authority, uh, 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 but with their representation, but not sufficient ever to outvote the rest of us. And I said all monies came across, no top slicing, the Learning Trust never top sliced. On the other hand, there was a point which I thought we really have grown up. There was discussion about uh, of schools, the head teachers forum about we need more support in some of our schools that are really in difficulties, really struggling. And at that point in time, the budget we'd been given was then suddenly upped by government, and we said, "Well, there's this extra money. Uh, we wouldn't, we we should, strictly speaking, give it out to the schools as you as you deserve in terms of numbers and all the rest of it." And what they said was, "No, we don't think that's a good idea." Tell you what, if you can match us 50-50, we'll put a proportion of that into expanding the capacity for school improvement, people. And we'll put another bit of money into another area. I thought when that happened, that was really, I thought, absolutely fine. Because they were acting as a body saying, no, we're going to work, we're going to give this money. It may not come to us because we're, we're quite good but we're working as a family and we're concerned about every kid, even if they're not in our school. The costs for the, for the Learning Trust were an annual negotiation with the council, and I was quite prepared to, uh, uh, to do that. And the contract was for 10 years. My first task, and the task of all those who were in the Learning Trust, it was a two-peer transfer from the authority into, in, into the Learning Trust. Uh, the First priority I found was, again, to raise the confidence levels of all schools, the, the, the trust employees, and so on. Confidence was absolutely rock bottom. Not surprisingly, everything that had been reported, every press cutting, even local people would be absolutely overwhelmingly critical of what was happening in education in Hackney. Uh, uh, and so that was a top priority. We also, secondly, had to have a very clear and explicit set of targets 
and not all quantitative. I was not interested in a box ticking quantitative approach to things. I wanted a broad I wanted to support the arts and music. I wanted to support sport. I wanted to make those essential ingredients. Now, and, and I got money from not just the trust but from other sources in Hackney, so that we had a programme in primary schools working with the London Symphony Orchestra to develop our specialist music people in primary schools, many of whom were not specialist music people. We had a programme of, of CPD, so we were growing a cadre of very good... We now in Hackney, I think, have, a, have an, our own orchestra. And if you walk out of here and look at, on the wall, you'll find out how many... There's 18,000 or something kids now are learning a musical instrument. I regard that as much as equally important to them attaining in a, a mathematics language, whatever it is. And in sport, I think we have the biggest inter-school competition for sport every year anywhere in the country. So it's not all quantitative. And what we needed was credible people to support the schools. And we had, finally, not surprised, to be, to be consistent in all matters. We take the difficult decisions and act with speed. In the first two weeks, I came into what was the uh, in-service training centre for Hackney. You may not believe it, but it was the top floor of this Pratt infant school. And I came in and there was a, uh, I joined a group of, of, of people, all of them were classroom assistants, and I sat with them. Not a single window in the building actually fitted the frame. The will wind whistled through. It was a grubby, miserable, dirty environment. There was not really access to good refreshments or anything. And that was the first two weeks. And I thought, well, if that's what we think about the staff who we pull in for in-service training, I'm hardly surprised that they, their confidence is low, their self-esteem is low, and why would anyone to come teach you? So I went back to Alan, and he said to me, how have you got on? I said, well, I've got on very well, actually, but I'll tell you now. I want a new CPD centre where it reflects what we think about our professionals in our schools. And this is it. Where, how did we pay for it? I said, well, the schools aren't paying for it. And the council's no money, so they won't pay for it. I want the maximum efficiency in this learning trust. I want no bureaucracy. And I want, over four years, I want to have saved the money. So the cost of this place, four and a half million, was saved out of the central budget for the Learning Trust and invested in this. I regard this as incredibly, I'm sad that they named it after me, but I'm, I'm not sad, but you know, a bit embarrassing. The important thing is you come into their building like this and I think every teacher deserves to be able to undertake their professional development in an area which says to them, we value you, we give you a good environment, we look after you. And if that's not what is given, then they should not be surprised if teachers don't want to come and work with them or don't stay with them. As I said, I wanted minimum bureaucracy. I made it clear, decisions, when, when, I, when people were appointed positions, I said, you make decisions, you take the action. I don't want, as previously, to have it to go through five layers of bureaucracy with five different forms being signed. It has to happen now. It has to happen quickly. Of course, that meant that the people were accountable for the decisions they made. But if you got the right people, they weren't frightened of that. And they weren't. I also wanted very clear forms of celebration and recognition for students and for those who work in our schools, including governors. We had a perfect opportunity to start it when, after a long refurbishment, the Hackney Empire was about to reopen. And we persuaded the Hackney Empire to let us hold the first celebration of student achievement. It was a broad spectrum across the piece of student achie achievement. Achievement against the odds, whatever. It wasn't particularly well attended, that first one. We didn't have a lot of seats occupied. The kids loved it. And we were able to persuade people who they were only too pleased to see to come and make the awards. Three years later, three years later, we had to move to the Tower Hotel near Tower Bridge 
and we, had, we had tables enough for 400 people and still we were short of spaces for people wanting to attend from the schools. We then moved the following year to having a recognition, not just a pupil achievement, we'd have that biannually, but also to recognising the achievements of our staff, our governors in schools. And it was simply a way of saying thank you and recognise. It doesn't matter who you are. All too often I found in teaching, nobody ever really said well done or thank you for what you've done or it's been great. It's almost expected. And we're, we're only human. We like to be told we're doing occasionally. We like a pat on the back. And I don't think teachers and others are anything any different from that. So, that's what we did. What, what about what about that? Well, you've heard a lot about what's happened. Just to fill in, and, and, and Tricia made a comment. In 2002, 30%, just around 30% of students in Hackney got five GCSEs A to C, which did not necessarily include English and mathematics, because that was not the measure at the time. In 2004, two years later, we got that up to 45%. It's now, as Trish has shown you, well over 60%. That 30%, if we do compare it to last year, I don't think it's this year, but last year, 75% of Hackney kids got five good GCSEs. So we've gone from 30 to 75, which is not a bad. Could do better. Absolutely. Could do better. You've heard about Key Stage 2 improvements. You've heard about school in inspection categories. But equally important, as I said, is the breadth of opportunity and opportunities in which we try to give young people and teachers in foreign visits uh, and, and so on. We've had groups of head teachers being, being paid for and sponsored by, by British Council and others uh, and, and so on. So it, it's broad. It, what I would suggest to you, school improvement is not and should not be a, a, a uniquely, tightly focused interest in can we, achieve the Eng can we achieve those English and maths results. Obviously they're important, but if that's all you focus on, then I'm not sure that we're educating children. And I'm for all for educating them rather than getting them simply to pass examinations. I want both. It's not an either or, I want both. And of course, in latter years, we've, we've begun to see a considerable growth in Oxbridge entries. I'm not sure I regard that. I mean, I think some people go to Oxbridge because they, their parents want them to go to Oxbridge. Um, I'm, however, there are people who think that's important. Well, fine, that's it. Lessons. Nothing surprising, really. They're not substantially different from those learned from London Challenge. Confidence building. It was tough initially working with the press because the press loved Hackney because it gave them a negative headline. Working with the local Hackney Gazette, bless their hearts. Nobody here from the Hackney Gazette, no. <laughs> uh, and national press. But I made it my job early on, since I knew most of the national uh, press education consultants, to try and get them to focus on some of the good things which are happening in Hackney. And now, I don't think we ever see anything negative in the press about Hackney. Not entirely due to me, but confidence building through the press and the recognition that we could give. So work, you've got to get the confidence of your staff, you've got to build their self-esteem, if that's, if that's necessary in your institutions. Challenging but consistent approach to failure. As some will say, and Tricia will tell you, uh, we, we didn't take any prisoners. We had to do what we had to do quickly. We had to do it on behalf of the children. We didn't do it inhumanely. Far from it. Far from it. But where tough decisions had to be made, they were made. But you have to be consistent. Intervention, where it's necessary, has to be quick. And the support has to be tailored to the circumstance of the school. I was fed up of seeing, in the past, as, as uh, Chief Inspector in HMI, fed up of seeing schools being promised things and not delivered for a long time. Not the least of which is often the therapy provision, speech and language therapy. And more and more of our children, uh, I guess in the country, particularly in London, have, uh, have uh, mental health problems. You can't be told, oh, well, there's somebody available for an appointment in six months' time. It's wanted there, so we employ our own now. 
simple solution. Spread across the schools is next to nothing, essentially. So rapid intervention and support. But we, you do need to have people who are credible. You need to focus always on building the capacity within schools. And as I said, it can sometimes be the subject <coughs> teacher, the subject leader in a primary school, but you do need that good leadership. You do need, and Michael Wilshaw is absolutely right. It, it cannot be argued against uh, that you do need uh, the, the leadership uh, to understand and, and accept. Lot of emphasis, again, on school-to-school -school working. If, if, this, if school A is very good at teaching mathematics, then put it in touch with the school that's not, and let them work together and swap over. Not in terms of staffing permanently, but let them work together, let them, uh, and so on. Personally, as a teacher, I started as a science teacher, and after three years I became involved with what was then called the Joint Matriculation Board, which doesn't exist now, it's all part of something called AQA. But the chair of the board of chemistry that I was involved with was the head of chemistry at Manchester Grammar School based in Manchester with the JMB. And one day he said to me, next time you're here, why don't you come to you can see chemistry, why don't you join me in my department in Manchester for half the day? And I did. And I watched what he was doing with 12 and 13 year old boys in that school. And I thought, bloody hell, I'm, I'm, not, I'm doing that with my sixth form. Why am I not challenging my 12 and 13 year olds in exactly the same way? Why am I assuming that they can't do it? It's got to wait till they're 17. Or so. And that transformed me, seeing what somebody else was asking by way of expectations and ambitions. And that's the key. We must always be ambitious for every student. We must have high expectations. And finally, I think something which I believe increasingly is at risk is enabling teachers to have good personal and professional development. I fear that under the present squeeze, it is easy to squeeze the professional development out of the budget. And I think that if we really are a profession, and we really are serious about retaining our staff, then we know from every survey, it is not salary which keeps them and makes them apply for a job or keeps them in. The first two things they mention are they want an employee who is concerned about their professional development and about their personal development. The two are not the same. They can overlap, but they're not exactly the same. And I worry that if we don't take CPD seriously enough in our system, we're at risk of probably losing the best teachers we have. I know that's a message at tough times, but believe me, if you don't invest, you will pay a significantly higher price down the line. And if you ask me, does it have any impact? Well, I happen to be chair of the board responsible for the National Science Learning Centre, the regional centres, and the National STEM Centre. It, it's given me a chance to go back to my roots. We've had three studies of the impact of in-service training provided by the national regional centres, one by the Public Accounts Committee, and one by the DFE, and one by a separate research. They have concluded, all three, looking at it in different ways at different times, <coughs> have concluded those teachers who attend the courses to improve science teaching in their schools are achieving, or helping to achieve, far better GCSE results in science than teachers in schools who haven't taken part. So if you want, if you want a trade-off, that's the important trade-off. Furthermore, we've now got evidence that that involvement retains their staff, not only in the school, but in teaching, more importantly, whereas the teachers who haven't been on it are much more likely to go. So I think if we really, it's my plea, we must be taken as a profession. We must start to see ourselves as a profession. We think we are, but you ask the public, they don't link us in, they don't put us in that professional bracket. Um, you ask a doctor, you ask a lawyer, they couldn't do their job without having being brought up to date, having training. Why should we assume that we, having done our training, don't need anything else after that? Would you like to be, would you like to be operated on by a surgeon who learned his trade 50 years ago and has never been anywhere since? This argument, just as a joke, well, not as a joke, as a fact, sadly, when we were talking about the creation of Ofsted, and Ken Clark at the time was Secretary of State, and he wanted to have 
what he referred to uh, uh, as the non-specialist member of the inspection team, which eventually got referred to as the, uh, you know, the soldier sailor candlestick maker type of person. Just as we were talking about this idea, he was going to Japan to, to see what was happening there. And the part, you must, don't repeat this, it's not public. Don't repeat this for heaven's sake. But at that meeting at one point, I said to him quietly, I said, you do realise, of course, that the pilot who's flying, who's never flown before, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> and he couldn't quite trigger, and he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're quite willing to accept somebody who's never been anything associated with the school. You're quite happy for them to come in and judge. Well, I've got you a pilot who's never been trained, but he's a nice guy. He'll do the job all right for you. Well, he, he, he proceeded to smoke his uh, cigars and take his whiskey, um, <laughs> which, was, which was equally fine. I thought. So it's a plea at the end, in a way, to say to you, please, please think about the continuous personal and professional development of what is the most most important resource, our teachers. And at the end of the day, I can stand here and say, you know, Blimey Trust being great. Actually, all we've done, in truth, is be there as a support for the people who really made the difference and make the difference every day. And that's the teachers, the head teachers, and so on. Those are the people. And that's why I value them so much. That's why I think they should be treated sometimes better than they are and recognised more than they are. I've said enough, if I've said too much already. Thank you.